Hello and a very warm welcome as we gather together for our online worship from around the district and indeed beyond. Glad for this opportunity to come to God and seek to worship him in spirit and in truth. We come, I know, with hearts that ache and minds that wonder at the state of our world as we see all too vividly the unspeakable horrors in Ukraine and the impact of that on the wider world and the impact of that on so many millions of lives. We recognise with great pain how so many are having to leave their home and seek sanctuary elsewhere. We recognise what terror that must be and what fear must be in their hearts and sadness, such sadness at leaving home and wondering where home might now be. In Isaiah we read words of promise to a people in exile. In Isaiah 32 we read these words, the Lord's justice will dwell in the desert, his righteousness live in the fertile field. The fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. As we come to worship God through these changing scenes of life all around us, we pray for the knowledge of God's presence and the unfolding of his promises amongst us. So let us worship.
God, our Father and our Mother, you surround us with parental love. You have given us this world to be both our home and our place of journeying and pilgrimage. Parent God, we, we praise, praise and, and thank you for your love. God, our Father and our Mother, you look after us with a parent's care. You provide for us, heal us, protect us and watch over us every day of our lives. Parent God, we, we praise, praise and thank you for your care. God, our Father and our Mother, you comfort us with a parent's touch. You wipe away our tears and calm our darkest fears. Parent God, we, we praise, praise and thank you for your comfort. comfort. God, our Father and our Mother, you guide us with a parent's understanding. You know our deepest needs and you help us to be the people we should be. Parent God, we, we praise and thank you for your guidance. God, our Father and Mother, you welcome us into your family. You have given us your Son as our brother and saviour, and you give us one another to love and care for. Parent God, we, we praise and thank you for your welcome. welcome. God, our Father and our Mother, you forgive us with a parent's generosity. When we turn to you, you run to meet us and greet us with open arms. Parent God, we praise and thank you for your forgiveness. God, our Father and our Mother, for the many ways in which you parent us, we praise and thank you for your love. In the name of Jesus, Son of God and Son of Mary. Amen. Amen. Let us spend a few moments in silence confessing our sins to our loving parent God. Lord, you search us and know us better than we know ourselves. Yet you have shown us in Jesus that nothing we do can destroy your love for us. We hear again his words of forgiving grace. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Psalm 32 Verses 1 to 7. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. 
You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. A meditation based on some words from Psalm 131 Like a weaned child clinging to its mother. Teach me to walk, loving God, as did my mother. For I know you delight in my independence, as did she. And when I fall, pick me up, dust me down, kiss me better, and I will walk and run again confident in your love. Hold me close, loving God, as did my mother. For you are filled with the power to comfort, as was she. And when life overwhelms me and I long to turn my face away, cradle me in the power of your love, that I dare look out at life once more. Never abandon me, loving God, as neither did my mother. For my need for you is even greater than it was for her. And when I leave you, seem to forget you, rarely call, your patient waiting love will bring me home. Luke 15, verses 11 to 32. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. 
So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and travelled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his feed fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost is found and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back, safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen! For all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, 
because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Today's Gospel reading is perhaps one of the most marvellous of the parables. Charles Dickens, no less, said it was the best story in the whole world. I heard an archbishop say that in the story of the prodigal son lies the whole gospel. I tend to agree. Here it is a potent reminder of how things are in God's kingdom. And it addresses one of the problems that besets us as human beings, that we're so good at getting things mixed up, we're ever so good at grabbing hold of the wrong end of the stick. And of course, getting wrong the wrong end of the stick is nothing new to our generation. It's happened down through all ages. And the whole point of Jesus telling the story was to try to help people to get hold of the right end of the stick, to see life, God and the universe in the right way. So how does this story help us get life, our relationship with God and our understanding of God's kingdom right? Well, firstly, when we get hold of the stick the right way round, we discover that coming to Christ is actually like travelling home rather than like travelling to a foreign country. Too often, I think, people think of church and Christianity as something a bit out of the ordinary, on the sidelines, something rather out of the normal course of life that some people find helpful and some people manage to get the hang of. With all the complexities that we might associate with going to live in a foreign land. And you know, that's a tragedy. The story reminds us that the younger son had travelled to the foreign land and that the journey that he knew that he needed to make was a journey from the foreign land home. And you know, that's how it is with any of us who want to discover more of God and God in our lives. At one level, of course, although there's complexity, God's story is rather simple. In the beginning there was God and he created and formed everything that we see and all that we can't begin to see. And he created humanity and it was good. In that picture of God's plan we see man and woman and God all in perfect relationship. Nothing forced about it, God at the heart of everything. But then things go wrong, the barriers go up, humanity pursues its own way and after all of the mass of history God sends Jesus to remind us that all he really wants is for us to find our home in him again. That if we can turn around our lives and walk towards God, we'll find him waiting to greet us and to say, welcome home. And the promise of the Bible is that ultimately that day will come for all of creation. Everything will be restored. So do you see the journey that we're invited on is about going home, not emigrating. So how sad it is that sometimes people do feel that going to church is like going foreign. People feel that they've got to learn a whole new language and start enjoying customs and practices that feel alien and so on and so forth. And sometimes it can be, can't it, that going to church can for some feel like it's travelling rather to a foreign land. But it's meant to feel like going home. Do you love those insurance stories that come along where people have filled in their insurance claim forms and uh, brought a smile at least to people's faces? 
Uh, one example is I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law and headed over the embankment. <laughs> well, how about this one? Coming home, I drove into the wrong drive and collided with a tree I don't have. <laughs> well, I think that's how some people feel about church and faith. Well, you might say it's like going home, but will it really feel like my driveway? And yet to those who find faith, again and again, the testimony that we hear from them is, do you know what? It's just like I've come home. And that's the way it's meant to be. A coming home into God's presence with God, outstretched arms, running down the road, waiting to greet us. So I hope we're a people who are dedicated and increasingly convinced that the message that we have to share is a message that's helping people to find God and to recognise that in God they're coming home. Secondly, when we get hold of the right end of the stick, some people discover that they've been in the house, but they've not been at home. I remember going on a baptism visit once, and I just couldn't quite believe what I found when I went into this house. The word minimalist was invented for this house. It was a lovely house, and money, it seemed, was no object. And in the lounge, there was a TV, a sofa, a chair, and a table. The colour scheme was white, and the furniture, where it could be, was glass. And remember, this was a baptism visit. <laughs> there was just me, mum and dad, and a baby. And that was it. And I was looking around wondering, where are the signs of everyday life, of relationship, of fun, of mess, of baby stuff, of shared interests and hobby? It, it felt like a show house at one level, uh, but it certainly didn't feel like a home. So what makes being in a house feel like a home? I think it's to do with feeling right there, isn't it? I guess it's something to do with a sense of belonging and safety. I remember about uh, three weeks after we'd moved into our new house back in 2002, when our daughter, Laura, was uh, about two and a half. One day, uh, Jill, my wife, was just holding Laura's hand as uh, they went down the stairs and uh, Laura uh, looked up and just said to uh, Jill, uh, we're not on holiday, are we? This is our home. <laughs> and we were really glad that so soon she was recognising that. Well, the older brother, uh, he'd never left his father, but quite obviously, as this parable unfolds, he obviously didn't feel at home. He didn't share the values of the home the values that his father was demonstrating in the welcome and the forgiveness offered to the younger son. He couldn't accept his father's attitude. He couldn't share what was in his father's heart. It is possible to be in the house, but not at home, isn't it? And so it's possible for us to be Good church people, if I can put it like that. People who are dutiful and servant-hearted and seeking to do our bit and our best. And yet, for us not to really share his values, God's values of welcome, forgiveness and new starts. To be in God's house, but not really at home with God. You see, the younger brother had abandoned his father physically, but the older brother had abandoned 
his father in his heart. There the whole time working and serving, but his heart was far from the father. And I don't think we should pretend that it's always going to be easy by any means to stay at home with God because God will always be pushing our hearts to new levels of compassion, to new levels of inclusivity. And God's heart, yeah, it takes some keeping up with sometimes to stay at one with God's heart to really stay at home in God's house. So I think all of us, we need to be checking that we've got the right end of that stick. That as God's family, wherever and how we meet and how we share our life together, that we can be growing in our sense of being at home with God. That folk who come seeking, that folk who we're serving, will find something amongst us that speaks of the eternal life of God. That they'll find a welcome and a care that speaks through and through of God's welcome and care. That it won't be for anyone that it feels like they've travelled to a foreign place. And for that we need to keep working at feeling at home with God, to keep asking ourselves about his values and how those values are becoming more our values. For our hearts to be growing in compassion, for our lives and our doors to be open open to change and renewal that comes as God's Holy Spirit blows amongst us. So may we hear the power of this parable again and the gospel that it proclaims that we might take hold of the right end of the stick and celebrate that the gospel is that invitation from God to come home and to share that hope with all the world. Amen.
Loving parent God, we pray with those who have had to leave their homes and travel to places where all is strange. We pray for refugee people, driven out of their country by warfare and fear, or escaping persecution for what they believe or who they are. And for those looking for better futures for themselves and their children. We pray for those unable to live in their homes any longer, who find themselves homeless or on the streets, or who can no longer look after themselves on their own, and for those whose family have no room for them in house or heart. Homemaker God, help all to find a home in you. God in Christ our brother, we pray with all who, like the lost son, long to return home, whose lives are on hold, who want to turn back on their journey. We pray for those who had to leave behind much that meant the most to them, the people they love and need and who love and need them the four walls that were their home and sanctuary, the objects, the language, the life that was familiar. We pray for our world, our church, ourselves, when in times of change and challenge we look back with longing to the familiar and secure. Homemaker God, help, help all, all to, to find, find a home in you. Spirit of God, living in us and all around us, we pray with those who feel that they do not belong, who do not feel at home where they live or work or worship, who do not feel at home with others or with you. We pray for those who have found that their differences have made them unacceptable to others, and those whose family home is not a place of love or safety. We pray for those who find themselves unlovable and worthless. Homemaker God, help all to find a home in you. We make our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who by his life among us, his dying and his being raised, has shown us the way back home to our loving parent God. Amen. Amen. We use the modern version of the Lord's Prayer. So we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
in Zephaniah chapter 3, we read these words. On that day I will gather you together and bring you home again. As we seek now God's blessing, our hearts ache to see that promise fulfilled around our world. As we rejoice in what it is to be at home with God, may we be inspired by God's values and God's heart to enable others to find the safety and the love that God intends for all his people. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.